Hello, I'm Joshua Rutherford, I'm gallery intern for the Emil H. Mathis Gallery and graduate teaching assistant in the Department of Art History at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. I am honored today to be able to present the Rogers Collection of Greek and Russian icons. Um, I'd like to also begin by acknowledging that the objects that I have the honor of presenting today were a gift to the university, which was made on behalf of the Rogers family. Charles Bowles Rogers was a passionate and well-connected collector, and that his children, Frederick and Mary, elected to donate his collection to the university has provided us the unique opportunity to offer hands-on learning experiences to accompany the in-class experience through the Emil H. Mathis Gallery and Art Collection. I'd also like to give a shout out to Lee Malik, our academic curator, for helping me get the detail images, and to Professor Richard Lazone, who shared his wealth of knowledge about these icons with me and to whom I will refer a few times throughout this presentation. So, what is an icon? While the word icon can mean many things for today's presentation, perhaps it's best to reduce it to the definition most suited to these objects. What we have here are wooden panels with tempera paintings, usually related to one of two key categories, portraits of holy figures and scenes relevant to feast days which we'll elaborate on a little bit later. So trying to understand where this form came from, um, we can turn to the Old Testament for some clues. Um, St. Paul in 2 Corinthians asserted that Christ is the icon of God. And this assertion has kind of been used to mark a double nature of Christ as both human and divine. Um, that notion has been extended by theologists such as uh, St. Athenaeus, um, who suggested that God became man in order that man might become God. So we're seeing that in Christian theology there were concerns about representing saints as too divine and God and Christ as too human. So icon painters had to find suitable ways in which they could capture both the divine and the human in icon paintings. Um, the practice of icon paintings has been around a long time. It was established somewhere between the 4th and 9th centuries. On the left here, we can see a 6th century version of Christ Pantocrator, which is the oldest known example. Um, well, they've been around a long time because of the fragility of both boards and tempura, um, few early examples survive. But because the representations of in icons were standardized, um, they used a sort of formulaic system which juxtaposed figures and symbols. Um, the variation in composition between earlier pieces in the 16th and 18th century icons that we have in the Mathis collection is somewhat marginable in most, in most cases. Um, but we will explore how painters did come to incorporate um, more modern styles from Western painting by using perspective, light, and shadows, and things like that. Um, many icon painters were associated with monasteries and other mystical schools of prayers. Um, successful icon paintings were seen to be the result of the painter realizing the divine within himself um, through their spirituality. So painters had to kind of meditate in order to realize the image they were trying to, to capture. Um, paganism, Christianity, and other religions coexisted in, this, in the region at the same time that Christianity was kind of starting to take off and be picked up by more and more people. Um, so there was, there was a, a, an urgency for painters to help in converting populans, populations to Christianity, and these icons played a role there. Uh, by establishing readable images which reflected key moments in the teachings of Orthodox Christianity, these icons served a proselytizing function, which provided them a means of educating and converting even the illiterate. So within this sort of canon of formulaic images, though, altering these representations was was kind of unheard of and even seen as blasphemous by some. Um, the, the form of the icon itself was sort of considered an, an, an essential component of this style of painting. So rather than emphasizing the scene um, or a narrative subject, Byzantine icons kind of represent the divine space uh, occupied by these holy figures. So there's this, uh, some have called it a silent backdrop. 
um, or serene and simplified background, which is intended to reflect that these figures have transcended the bodily world and that they're residing in a sort of spiritual dimension. Um, the use of gold leaf was, was helpful here. It helped illuminate the spiritual dimension, but artists also included other symbols which identified key figures or details related to their, to their biography, um, which we'll touch on a little bit more later. So from here, let's go ahead and dive into the Rogers collection and take a look at, uh, at some of these icons. So this is the first icon we're going to look at today. This is a 16th century version of the Christ Pantocrator form. So Pantocrator can just kind of translate uh, in many ways. Um, a general translation is generally almighty, all-powerful, or omnipotent. But uh, scholars have also gone for more literal translations and come up with things like ruler of all, or my favorite, sustainer of the world. Um, the Pantocrator form became a really, really significant representation in the Byzantine canon very early on, as we saw in that 6th century example um, a few slides ago. Um, and it's been reinterpreted by many artists, but still kind of maintains this canonical form. There's certain details of the Christ Pantocrator form that are um, almost universal. Um, so this example is really valuable for our teaching collection because it follows this canonical Christ Pentarchiter form and it gives us the ability to start to kind of read the attributes of a, of a Greek icon. Um, like we can read the attributes of Greek gods um, because they standardized forms and, ins and left inscriptions on, on sculptures and pottery. Um, here in Byzantine icons, we see some, some similarities in standardization similar and, and the use of symbols and rep repetition. So a uh, big marker here, we can see the halo around Christ's head. Um, the halo itself is just kind of a, a universal symbol of holiness. But within the halo of Christ's pentocrator forms, it was common to, for the cross to be formed, um, a cross to be formed within the halo by placing intersecting lines. Um, here we can see that around, cross, around Christ's head. Each arm of this cross is intended to represent one branch of the Holy Trinity. Um, so in this specific example, we can actually see that within the lines, the artist has included three Greek characters, Omega, Omicron, and Nu. Um, and the translation of these characters is, is roughly, I am who I am, which is intended to be a reference to God's divine name as it was revealed to Moses in Exodus 3.14. Moving on and looking a little further into the image, if we look into the corners, we can see these two circular symbols within which the one on the left says I see and the one on the right says X see. These symbols are called Christograms. And what they are is they're abbreviations of words based on the Greek spelling. By taking the first and the last letter of the Greek words for Jesus Christ, it was abbreviated as I see X see, as we see here. In addition to this, there was a sort of gestural language that uh, most Byzantine uh, populations would have been familiar with. So Christ, with his uh, right hand, is making a gesture that in this, in this sort of hand language would have represented ICXC as well. Um, and we can see here that that was also shared with... Uh, that was shared with the example from Mount Sinai from the sixth century. So this hand gesture has been around for at least 10 centuries at the point this painting was created. Likewise, in his left hand, um, in the Mount Sinai version, Christ holds the New Testament, and in the version from the Mathis collection, we also have Christ holding the New Testament. So clearly the 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 symbols kind of elucidated Christ's holiness, his almightiness, his all-powerfulness in this respect. Um, but also the backdrop can kind of be seen to contribute to this, this like lush gold leaf backdrop that separates him from a human space. And these symbols kind of impose their additional meanings into the, into the image. So the symbols not only identify the figure of Christ, but they can seem to see, be seen to sort of 
express his omnipotence. The image is meant to infuse the meaning of Pentocrator into the image of Christ by juxtaposing the human form and divine symbolism. Um, and because this standardization happened, it really led to the, the mass production of this form. So here we see some coins from the Rogers collection in which the Christ Pentocrator form is used on currency that was circulated. So this is from three different uh, reigns of Constantines here that we see these coins, but it might have been hard for us to identify this representation, um, but now that we've become familiar with the iconography a little bit, we can kind of see here that they all three have a halo intersected by crosses. We can see the hand gestures in the one on the left and in the one on the right. We can see the New Testament in all three versions. So we can identify this figure without being able to read the inscription on this one on the right that says, Jesus Christ, King of those who rule. Um, thank you, Richard, for the translation on that one. But even though we can't read ancient Greek to be able to translate these coins, we can still identify the form because of this standardization, these repetitions. So let's move on. These uh, next two examples from the collection are examples of a dual portrait form of the Virgin and Child that was known as the Hodigatria. The form actually gets its name from the origin, um, which is the Hodagon Monastery in Constantinople, which could be traced all the way back to the 8th century. So this is an example of a form that was popularized by monasteries or mystical schools, and it kind of reveals how these monasteries and mystical schools held an influence over the canon of acceptable forms for icons. Um, so let's kind of jump into the iconography here and see what this form is really all about. Um, in both four versions here, we can see some commonalities in the basic form and palette. Um, the figures have halos. The figures are arranged in the same way with Mary on the viewer's left and Christ on the viewer's right. Um, Mary's robe is red in both images, symbolizing divinity, and Christ's is yellow to sort of symbolize humanity. And the gesture of Mary's right hand motioning to draw our attention towards the child Christ, who is perched on her left, on her left hand, is a significant for, uh, part of this form. Um, oftentimes this form is referred to as Our Lady of the Way, or She Who Points the Way, in translation, and this is in reference to this gesture of Mary motioning to Christ, guiding us towards Christ. Um, we also see Christ here, even as a child, holding this scroll to symbolize his wisdom and the wisdom of God that he carries with him. Uh, with his right hand, though the orientation is different in both, he's making what would have been known to Byzantine viewers as a blessing gesture. Um, so Christ is, is both portrayed as wise and blessing humanity, even as a child. Like in the Christ Pentocrator form, where Christ was labeled with the Christogram IC, XC, we also see that in these examples, Christ is labeled with IC, XC as well. Um, the Virgin Mary is likewise identified through a Christogram MPOY, um, which is a little less visible on this example on the right. Um, this is an abbreviation of the term Mater Theos, or Mother of God, in Hodegatrius, Mary is often shown with starbursts, one on her head and one on each shoulder, the left shoulder often hidden by the child. In the image on the left, we can see that we can see the star on her right shoulder and on her head, but Christ hides the one on her shoulder. In the image on the right, we can see the stars on both sides of her chest, but there is no star on her head. Um, my suggestion is perhaps that the halo itself was meant to be the star because it's sort of stylized in this example. Um, the stars have been interpreted to allude to navigation, um, emphasizing Mary's leading the way as an extension of her gesture, um, but others have also interpreted the stars to allude to Mary's eternal virginity before, during, and after her Immaculate Conception, which was a significant notion to the Greek Orthodox Church. Um, 
Christ halo in the example on the left we can see also bears the markings of omega, omicron, and nu um, as we discussed in relation to the Christ pentocator above. Um, it's not in the example on the right so this is not necessarily a universal um, use of those symbols but I did think it was cool that it carries over into this example as well. Um, the, the, perhaps the most distinct difference here in these examples is Mary's crown. Um, Mary, in the example on the right, is wearing this crown with flowers in it. Um, the crown is part of a separate iconographic canon associated with the Virgin by some schools of icon painters. The Rosa Rugosa alludes to Mary's title as the Rose Without Thorn, and so this painter was sort of alluding to that title, the Rose Without a Thorn, by including this crown in their depiction. Um, while Byzantine icons were kind of known to avoid narrative compositions, adding little symbolic allusions like this allowed icon painters to imbue the, the icon with an additional layer of meaning while still remaining within the iconic graphic form. So while these examples, like the Pantocrator above, demonstrate the significance of standardization of forms to the legibility of icon paintings, they also reveal how artists could exercise some freedom in their representation, so long as it contributed to the symbolic value of the icon. So now is where we're going to get into the icons commemorating feast days within Orthodox Christianity. This icon represents St. Basil, Gregory, John Chrysostom, and Athanasius, the four Greek fathers, and then on the right we can see St. Paraskevi. Each of these saints is given a feast day in Greek Orthodox Christianity. So the category of feast day representations that I alluded to in the, in, in the introduction is still aligned with portraiture, but here we more commonly see groupings of saints in contrast to the forms used to represent primary figures such as Christ Pentocrator and the Hodogatria. Rather than the portrait presentation of the prior images, we actually see the full bodies of the saints presented here, oriented frontally in rich, colorful robes. The four Greek fathers can be seen making the Greek sign for the cross with their right hands by crossing their third finger and their thumb. In their left hands, each holds a book of their teachings. All four of the founding fathers was the theologist of the Greek Orthodox Church. Like the examples above, the use of Christograms in this image would have helped people familiar with ancient Greek to be able to identify the figures represented here. Unfortunately, my skills in this department are a bit too limited to elaborate on the markings seen here, but I did want to pull them up in the detail, just to show you that this is a sort of uniform iconographic detail of these images. On the right, we see the female Saint Paraskevi, the patron of the sick. I admittedly knew very little of her, but our medievalist Professor Lozon was able to help provide some context here. So we see her holding a Christ and a, a cross and a palm leaf, um, which are actually symbols of her martyrdom. <clears throat> Professor Lazon let me know that there were actually two Paraskevis. One was martyred under Antonine, and the other was martyred under Diocletian. But the two have become fused in ortho ortho Orthodox iconography. So there were, though there were two living Paraskevis, they're represented as one saint in iconography, which I think is really cool. Um, like the other saints that are, are um, honored with a feast day, Paraskevi is venerated on Friday, the day devoted to honoring holy women and virgins. So Paraskevi also holds a special place in this church. Another observation that Professor Leeson made that was worth noting is that the 18th century date is justified on the account of the impressionistic treatment of the ground with cast shadows. This is an example of how painters use devices like perspective and shadow to demonstrate a late Western influence in Greek icon painting. While retaining many of the formal characteristics of the Byzantine icon canon, we can see how painters took liberty in details such as perspective and lighting, and these elements provide a greater sense of depth to the otherwise flat image. This icon was painted to commemorate the consecration of a church. Um, this panel depicts several figural groups and is one of the most complicated of the Rogers collection, I would say. Um, despite the vast number of figures presented here, though, the distinctive symbols and forms of the Byzantine canon are employed here, so each, each individual is represented distinctly. 
I must admit, my familiarity with icons would not enable identifications in a piece so complex as this, so again I had to defer to Professor Lison for some help identifying the figures represented here. In the foreground, the bottom of the canvas, we can see the, paint, the saints Peter and Paul with their fellow apostles. Um, and there's Peter and Paul. Um, all right, and then in the grouping behind them, we can see Saint Constantine and his mother, the Empress Helena. They, um, Helena was held to have discovered the true cross in Jerusalem, so she's a very significant figure as well. Um, and they're presented centrally, sort of right above this little temple here. To the sides of Constantine and Helena, we see other saints, clerics, and martyrs of the Greek Orthodox religion, tiered in such a way as to create a sense of perspective in this composition. While I'm unable to identify most of these figures, you can see here how each one is distinctly represented, and they are represented in such a way that a, a Greek viewer would probably have been able to identify them fairly easily. At the top of the composition, we can see Christ, flanked by St. John and the Archangels, as well as the Virgin Mary. Again, we see the cross and Christ's halo, um, demarcating him from the other figures, as well as Christograms identifying Christ and the Virgin Mary. Like in the previous example, we can see an influence here from the trends in the late West. The perspective created by the tiered figures marks another attempt to add depth to the image. This is my favorite icon from the collection, for sure. Perhaps the two most famous apostles, Peter and Paul, both of whom were martyred in Rome, are here shown embracing in brotherly affection. Professor Lizone helped me understand this context a little bit better. The subject here probably refers to the reconciliation of the two apostles after a dispute they had at Antioch. He suggested that St. Peter represents the converted Jews and St. Paul, the Church of the Gentiles, and they were held to be equal in faith, merit, and sanctity, and together represent the universal Church of Christ. So this is kind of um, representative of the idea of conversion um, to Christianity, as we as we discussed earlier. So this is significant to the to the icon paintings because it emphasizes their proselytizing function. Um, the gilded wood background here really emphasizes the careful detail in the rendering of Peter and Paul's faces. Um, I love the depth and the shading and contours of their faces. It really adds a, a level of depth, but also of a sort of emotion to the image. Um, while they're sort of making these ambivalent expressions, there's like the marks under their eyes almost make them seem like there's a little bit more joy than in other representations. Um, well, we, we may not know enough to identify them on our own. Peter and Paul were really well known through their biblical stories and through visual representations. Um, St. Peter was always shown with curly, silvery white hair and a short, thick beard. And St. Paul was commonly depicted with a bald head, long face, and a long flowing beard. Um, so the Byzantine medallions here that are flanking, these are both from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, but this is just to kind of show you how... Um, this representation was standardized through Byzantine iconography so that you can easily identify these figures. The delicacy in the rendering of the faces contrasts so sharply with the bold lines on the drapery in this example, which to me seem distinctly modern. They almost remind me of pop art and Roy Lichtenstein. Um, while the shading of the face provided depth, here the stark lines are used to emphasize the contrast, but also the contours of the fabric, but still leaving the faces of the icons as the central visual emphasis of the image. In the clouds above the two, Christ appears with both arms outstretched in a gesture of blessing. Not only is the gilded background here a divine abstraction of reality, but Christ's parting of the scene to enter like this abstracts the setting of the painting farther, displacing it from the material world. This example does show a progression in the way the figures are displayed. Um, while the other figures have been displayed predominantly frontally or with their head tilted to the side, 
Um, the embrace here kind of signals a narrative. It's almost illusory, but it's within the divine setting. It's it's a narrative function. Um, and the figures, rather than being frontally oriented, as they've as we've seen in the other examples, they're angled to embrace one another. They're turning towards towards each other. So there's there's a lot more action going on here. In in addition to presenting the figures more more naturalistically in their facial characteristics. Um, so we're going to look at one more example here. Um, this last example, we're going to look at an earlier variation on the form of the Holy Trinity. Um, and because this example is from, Reich, from Russia, in contrast to the other examples we've discussed, which are all from Greece, we can kind of start to see some of the regional variations in form, style, and even color that were used um, in icons. And there's a variation between the ones that were produced in Russia and the ones that were produced in Greece, which I think we can already start to see here. Um, so while I was able to identify this form based on a famous icon, Professor Leeson didn't, did help me understand the biblical context of this image. So the, the Holy Trinity here in this example is symbolized by three angels, and they're intended to be the three angels who visited Abraham and his wife Sarah on the plains of Mamre in Genesis 18. So the three angels, um, from left to right in order, this is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The middle figure, perhaps, is the only one that we would have been able to identify, as again, within the cross here, we see, or within the halo, we see the cross and the markings of Omega, Omicron, and Nu, just as we've seen in other depictions of Christ. The three figures are grouped around an altar-like table here, upon which are placed two cups, two radishes, and a chalice containing a calf's head, um, which the central angel is blessing. Um, this is a symbol of the Mass. So the composition here, if we look at it in comparison to this example of the Trinity from Andrei Rublev, we can see that the form of the angels is almost directly mirroring this from the Andrei Rublev composition, which I thought was really interesting. Um, so Professor Lison shared with me that in 1551, the Council of a Hundred Chapters, meeting in Moscow, specifically instructed all painters to turn to Rublev's guidance and instruction. And so, again, as we saw with the Hodegatria, we can see here how Rublev, who was painting in a monastery, um, and sort of part of a mystical school, canonized a form by making this form, and then we see it carried into the 18th century with the example we have from the, the Rogers Collection. So although the style and the iconography of the UWM icon are de definitely of the 15th century, the age of the wood and the freshness of the board, Professor Leeson has suggested, argue for the 18th century date that we've placed on this. And this returns to another note that we kind of touched on in the beginning. While icon painting emerged early on, between the 4th and 9th, uh, 9th centuries, the standardization of iconography, symbols, and forms generated a style of painting which could, in effect, transcend time while continuing in its original function. Because the standardized iconography carried into these works produced into the 16th and 18th centuries, the imagery itself can be hard to place chronologically without paying attention to how the material details and how the object has been preserved. For me, Understanding how images like this have endured through time is powerful. Through repetition, icon painters were able to produce forms easily legible to the masses, literate or otherwise, which continue to circulate in the 21st century. We see these on candles. If you walk past a Greek Orthodox church, you will see something reminiscent of an icon painting uh, nearby, almost without fail. And we even see similarities in um, Catholic representations of, of holy figures. So the form of the icon is something that developed extremely early on and really has transcended time and is continuing to go on and on. So by creating ways for these central figures of Christianity be to be taught to the mouses without depending on the written word, icon painters leveraged the possibilities of the visual as a proselytizing tool the repetition of these forms, over time, established a visual lexicon which enabled the spread of Orthodox Christianity in the East. Which is a really cool idea. I mean, I'm not Christian myself, but 
looking at these images and kind of understanding how these painters were able to establish a visual language that helped teach people that couldn't read these stories from the Bible, these figures from the Bible, in a way that they could read them not in just one image, but in other images. So this is a really powerful uh, example of how the visual plays a role in the linguistic and how the, the visual art has played a role in shifting cultural um, connections to religion and even, as we saw in the example of coins here, how religion and politics became connected in representational forms. Um, so I really hope that you've enjoyed this presentation. I've enjoyed talking about these icons with you, and I just want to end by saying thank you all for your time. Have a great day.